Now, on the problem of evil, Dr. Pei challenges me to actually put out the argument. And I, I, I'm extremely puzzled, as puzzled as by his assertion that mathematicians don't accept the actual incident, uh, to which if I have time I'll return, but by the assertion that no one has ever made good on this argument. On the contrary, it seems to be the most powerful and indeed, I think, a completely unanswerable argument against the existence of a certain kind of God. Come back to this in a minute, a certain kind of God. Only if you define God as being all-powerful so God can do anything, and all-benevolent so God only will allow or will do good things and omniscient so that God actually knows how to bring about good or prevent evil. Now, those three things entail that if such a being exists, evil cannot exist. Now, I'm willing to go along with the idea that, yes, indeed, God exists, and what is really happening is that all evil is illusory. So when you think you're in agony, don't worry. Because since God is protecting you, you can't really be in agony because God would not allow that. Now, of course, if that's what's happening, then once you find out that this is the case, you never need to worry about being in pain anymore. I think that's implausible. It's not, I agree, a deductive proof. But I don't accept several of the premises. If we had a lot more time, we could have written these premises on the board, etc., that uh, Dr. Craig has asserted that I haven't addressed. And in this particular case, it seems to me that the argument is indeed cogent. And it's not claimed to be, it's not claimed to be deductive because it relies on the empirical premise that some things are bad. Now, when I say some things are bad, does that commit me to believing in objective value? I want to say I believe in objective value in the following sense. That given human beings as they are, some things promote their well-being and other things impede it. That's objectively true. And that is all that you can know. And if by objective you mean that it would be exactly the same if no human beings had ever existed in that far off gal galaxy where there are no conscious beings, then I say, of course not. Of course there's no objective value in that sense. And we don't need it. We do need to be kind to one another. We do need to understand as well as we can the ramifications of those complex, complex dispositions that we have, in fact, inherited from natural selection. And which have led people at different times to think different things are good or bad. But we're not in those times. It's completely, it's completely pointless to say, well, I disapprove of Greek slavery. You may say it, and you just mean, what do you mean? You mean if you would have been a Greek, you would have been against it? No, you wouldn't. Do you mean that if you had a Greek in front of you now, you would whip them? No, it doesn't. It's completely meaningless. Value can only be judged, as it were, on the spot, and that is because, indeed, there is no such thing as value that is completely independent of any human reality. Um, now, on chance, once again, and on laws, very quickly, it's true that a law is not a cause. But a law makes possible certain causal connections. And there is nothing in what Dr. Craig said that makes it logically impossible that there are deeper laws which are such that in what we call nothing, there could be the possibility of something coming about just by absolute chance. Thank you.
recommendations, but my question is obviously uh, directed to you, Dr. Kerr. Um, from my understanding of your position is that uh, the natural conditions that you mentioned that necessitate this bulk, that can lead to human existence and the life that we see, kind of places human existence itself on a pedestal and provides a privileged position of us as being the main purpose of our universe. Um, what I wanted to know is why is it not possible and probable that a different set of conditions could potentially lead to um, different living conditions that could eventually lead to a set of creations that pretty much don't need the set of criteria that we require, such as oxygen, such as water, yet they're just as functional and just as probable and just as valid creatures. Yeah. So going back, um, sorry, just also adding in the issue of the class, the whole number of things that um, Dr. D'Souza tried as an experiment, you're right, it, it would be very highly improbable for those numbers to eventually lead to the natural numbers that we, we depend on for our human and daily existence. But if this was, this experiment was repeated enough times, why is it not possible that we could eventually lead to that number? And hypothetically, and we would come up with a number that although would not lead to us as human beings and exist, our existence as possible, it could, it could lead to creations that are just as probable. Although again, it would not exclude us. It would exclude us, I apologize. Okay, there are a number of questions there combined into that uh, question. First of all, certainly you can try to have repeated numerous throws of the dice uh, or spins of the roulette wheel, and that will obviously increase your chances of getting the result. And this would be the proposal of having, for example, some sort of multiverse hypothesis or oscillating universe. The problem is uh, that those theories are physically untenable. Uh, the board guth vilenkin theorem that I mentioned in my opening speech applies to the multiverse as well and shows that it cannot be infinite in the past but must have a finite beginning. So that it may well be the case that even if there were many repeated chances, they would be sufficient to generate uh, a universe that is finely tuned in the way that ours is. Now, don't misunderstand me. When I say fine-tuned or when theorists talk about fine-tuning, they're not saying that the purpose of the universe is humanity. That, that's not the point. The point is that the range of life-permitting values for intelligent life to exist anywhere in the cosmos uh, is so extraordinarily narrow that it, it is an improbability that is literally incomprehensible and in incalculable. Uh, so I'm not saying that we are the purpose of the universe uh, based on this argument, but rather that the best explanation for these values all falling into this range, even if that would mean there's intelligent life, as you imagine, somewhere else in the cosmos or somewhere later, that this is not the result of physical necessity. There's no necessity to be this way. It's not the result of chance, given the high improbability and the independent pattern. And so it seems to me that the best explanation is that this is a result of an intelligent planet. Thank you. Well, you have uh, just one thing, which is that I, I don't accept uh, the, the, the idea that it cannot be a result of necessity for the simple reason that we don't know whether there could be meta-level laws uh, which would make it possible and indeed necessary that those, uh, that those uh, parameters should have just the range of um, uh, values that they do. Um, so, it, it, I, I, I think that that's a weak premise, although I think I don't need to rely on it, because I think it is perfectly, also perfectly possible that we're looking at pure chance. Okay. I, I, I guess this is probably an easy question. Um, I just want to ask, how is it possible to um, incite the existence of evil on a so-called evil actions of God to deny God's existence and yet deny the uh, existence of objective good and evil. That, yeah. so, so, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Okay. How is it possible to incite the exist existence of evil or the so-called evil actions of God um, to deny God's existence and yet deny the existence of objective good and evil? 